Hi, this is Dr. A with part two of the lecture on instrumentation for clinical chemistry. Okay, so we're going to continue our venture into instrumentation by talking about potentiometry. So potentiometry is a measurement of the electrical potential or, or the voltage difference um, between the two electrodes in the electrolyte solution. There is a reference electrode that has a constant voltage in a sample electrode, which is the measuring electrode, which is measuring um, you know, the electrolytes in the sample. So the ion concentration is then calculated from the measurement of the potential difference between the two electrodes, and it uses the Nernst equation. Um, so an example that is widely used in a lot of the large chemistry analyzers is going to be the ion-selective electrodes. Um, so the ion-selective electrodes, or ISCs, are membrane-based, and that is a selective part. So uh, this is a general schematic of an ion-selective electrode, and there's a membrane here that will allow um, a certain ion to cross over to the exclusion of other ions and um, change the membrane and you change the ion that you measure for. So there's usually a specific electrode for each ion that you're trying to measure and what differentiates one electrode from the other is going to be uh, usually the membrane and then maybe some of the electrolyte solution too. So <clears throat> the membrane then allows it to respond to a certain ion and that is in an uh, electrolyte solution, a mix, right? Because like in ceramoplasma, you have a mix. You have sodium, you have chloride, you have potassium, and then you also have some calcium and magnesium and all that kind of stuff. And so if you want to get a sodium measurement, you don't want to measure any of the other ions. And uh, they always measure free ion concentration, meaning anything that would be bound to proteins would not be measured. <clears throat> All right, so your um, pH electrodes are another type of uh, potentiometry. They are a glass electrode, uh, and it measures the ion that it measures is the hydrogen ion, and the hydrogen ion activity then is converted into a specific pH. Um, and then you also have the PCO2 electrode, which is basically a pH electrode with sodium bicarb at the reference electrode, and um, the dissolved CO2 is converted to hydrogen ions, which is what the pH electrode measures then. And uh, they are that's what measures the hydrogen ion. So for basically for every CO2 molecule, there's a hydrogen ion that is made. And so it's, it's a one-one relationship. And so uh, if you can measure the hydrogen ion concentration and you can deduce from that the CO2 concentration. So um, CO2 is converted to hydrogen ion via uh, the equation here. So add water, becomes carbonic acid, and then this associates into bicarb, and this hydrogen ion and the activity of that hydrogen ion is measured. So if you um, look, it's a little bit harder to see. This graphic's not really big, but basically your sample comes through here. So in the sample here, you would have obviously a mix of everything you're looking for. And this is an example for of the CO2 one. And then the CO2 would cross over here. Um, and, and this is a measurement electrode right here. And as it crosses over, um, it would be converted to hydrogen ions. And then hydrogen ion activity here is going to be measured by uh, as it interacts here with the measurement electrode. And then here on the side, you have the reference electrode um, and you have a sodium bicarb solution that it's standing in. And so it measures the, the potential difference between these two electrodes then um, is going to tell it the hydrogen ion activity, which then relates to the pH. And then for the CO2, then that relates to the CO2. Uh, the hydrogen ion activity uh, relates to the CO2. Okay, so let's think about this critically for a second. So if you are measuring electrolytes by ion selective electrode in a big analyzer, would you expect um, that one ion selective electrode would measure all of these electrolytes or that each electrolyte would need its own ion selective electrode? So critical thinking on that. And here is an example of the older version of the electrodes. So these are a little bit bulkier. Um, they have obviously been miniaturized and they're a lot smaller now. 
Uh, but you can see there is, here's the sodium one, it would have a specific membrane, and here's the potassium one with a specific membrane, here's the chloride one, and here's the reference electrode. And you can kind of see here, the this right here is where the sample would go. So these would actually be all lined up, and then the sample would go through this one, then would go through that one, then go through that one, and through the reference, and then you would get, the sample would be all the way across, and you would get readings in each and uh, they would give you the concentration then of sodium, of uh, potassium, of chloride. So um, a little bit more on these ion selective electrodes. There are, there are two ways to measure. There's direct ion selective electrodes and indirect. So the difference between the direct and indirect is the direct ion selective electrodes will just use undiluted samples, so just pure serum or plasma, whichever one um, it's using. And um, those are sensitive, again, only to free ions. Um, so, for example, it could um, be used to measure ionized calcium, but it doesn't detect bound ion. So, um, if you, um, we haven't learned in this semester yet, but basically half the calcium is ionized and half the calcium is bound to protein. And so, if you want to know which part is ionized, which is the part that actually can have a physiological effect, then you would want to get an ionized calcium level, and you can do that using the direct ion selective electrode method. Another advantage of the direct, direct ion selective electrode, of course, is that it is not affected by high protein or high lipids because it measures the free ions to the exclusion of all the other stuff. The indirect ion selective electrode methods, they use a diluted sample, and this is what you find in the big chem analyzers. And, uh, in these types of um, ion selective electrode uh, with the diluted samples, high protein or high lipid levels will interfere with the measurement of the electrolytes. Uh, what happens is you tend to see an underestimation of the electrolyte concentration, and this is because of the protein lipid content, which causes a volume exclusion effect. And um, so if you have a highly lipemic sample or a really concentrated, again, high protein, uh, maybe a lot of antibodies or something's going on there, then you have to know that, um, you know, if you get a sodium of 135, it may actually be higher than that in, in the patient. Uh, a couple more on uh, things of electrochemistry, there's voltammetry. Um, this can be used, for example, for the measurement of lead and whole blood by an anodic stripping voltammetry. Um, it basically measures the current that's flowing into or out of an electrode in a solution. Pretty simple. Um, not widely used, but still, I um, mean, it's a way to measure lead. And then amperometry, that this one is used, um, it's the measurement of the current flow that's produced by an oxidation reduction re reaction, so a chemical reaction, in an electrochemical cell. Uh, with the uh, application of a uh, constant external voltage. So we have electricity and we have chemical reaction, and um, that can um, produce a current flow. The oxidation re uh, reduction reaction can produce a current flow. Uh, an example is the Clark PO2 electrodes. So this is how we measure PO2, uh, partial pressure of O2. And uh, you would obviously find this, for example, in the ABG analyzer. Uh, so uh, before I tell you more about the Clark uh, electrode, let's think about this here with the direct and indirect IC. So if your analyzer uses an indirect ion selective electrode to measure electrolytes and your sample is grossly lipemic, would you expect a patient's sodium level to be uh, read normally by the analyzer, falsely elevated, or falsely decreased? Again, it's just kind of a memory recall there. All right, so let's dive into how this Clark PO2 electrode works. Um, again, found in the blood gas analyzers, it is how it detects the partial pressure of oxygen. The PCO2 is a modified pH electrode, and then the pH is a pH electrode, okay, for in the blood gas. So it measures the partial pressure of O2 in blood using an O2 sensing electrode. This O2 sensing electrode is made of a gas permeable membrane. So that membrane allows only oxygen to cross and no other uh, gas or electrolyte or anything like that. There's also a cathode and an anode. Uh, they're represented here. You can barely see the plus and minus, so I made it a little bigger here. So there's one there and these are separate, okay? 
And there's an electrolyte solution um, in which the either oxidation or reduction reaction happens. So with a Clark electrode, um, is going to be a reduction reaction. So um, metal plus an electrolyte solution is going to uh, create either oxidation or reduction uh, of the compound, uh, and that's be a reaction. And so um, in this case, the metal is platinum, and with oxygen crossing, it actually causes a reduction of the oxygen, which means a creation of electrons, okay? So um, basically the way it works is for every molecule of oxygen that crosses from the sample, that crosses the membrane and starts interacting with the metal and the electrolyte solution. So it crosses over here, it mixes with the water in the electrolyte solution, and it, the, it causes a reduction reaction that uh, causes creation of four electrons. So one molecule of O2 picks up two molecules of water in a reduction reaction in uh, four electrons and creates four hydroxide ions, okay? And as it does that, the more oxygen crosses over, the more electrons are created, the more of a current flow there is. And so the magnitude of the current flow is proportioned to the amount of O2 in the sample. That's how the Clark P2 electrode, gas sensing electrode works in your ABG analyzer. All right, so next question is, which one of these readings would produce the greatest flow of electrons in that O2 gas sensing electrode, a PO2 of 65 or a PO2 of 92? Select an answer. All right, a little bit more electrochemistry. There's conductometry and coulometry. So conductometry will measure electro, um, electrolytic, oh goodness, electrolytic, sorry, conductivity. So it's um, it's going to measure uh, a current that is proportional to the amount of ions. Um, and this is called electrical conductance, and it can be used often to assess water purity. Uh, and this is, would be in some of your water, water filtration systems, such as millipores and stuff. So basically, the more ions you have in the water, the easier it is for the electrical current to cross over and uh, for it to conduct the electricity. And so a high reading of electrical conduct conductance means it conducts electricity really easy, really as well across a certain path. That means the more ions are present in the water and the less pure that water is, meaning pure, free of ions and everything else. Uh, one of the applications of conductometry is also the Coulter principle, which uses electrical impedance to count cells in your uh, Coulter counters or your hematology analyzers. So basically the way that works is there's an aperture and opening and there's a current uh, that flows across that opening. And every time a cell passes through the current and breaks through the current, it counts one. And so it feeds a whole bunch of red cells through and it counts them, it lines them up single file and it counts them one at a time uh, for a certain amount and a certain volume. And then you can get your red cell count and you can do your white cell count and stuff like that, like that, using the culture counter. And then there's colometry and it's based on amperometry where uh, the quantity of electricity in coulons needed to convert the analyte of interest quantitatively to a different oxidation state than uh, it is what it does is what it measures. Uh, the product of the current is in amperes and the time in seconds required to reach an endpoint, then it yields your number of coulombs. Um, it's an old sweat chloride analyzer. That's pretty much the only application we have that I know of anyway in the lab. And um, the coulomb is proportional to the quantity of chloride in the sample of sweat. Uh, sweat chloride, as a reminder, is used to diagnose cystic fibrosis. Although, nowadays, they're using genetics to diagnose uh, cystic fibrosis, but it's the older way is still done in some labs. So, anyway, chromatography, um, all the chromatography techniques are physical separation techniques. So, um, if you think about uh, serum and all the stuff, or plasma, all the stuff that's mixed into serum, plus who knows like what a person maybe have ta has taken also drug-wise or whatever, um, if you needed to separate something out to be able to measure it, you would use chromatography. Okay, so um, 
the whole, all the chromatography uh, or physical separation techniques that are based either on physical or chemical interactions of compounds in a sample. There is always a mobile phase and a stationary phase. So there's always two phases interacting with each other. Uh, compounds that would interact more with the stationary phase, uh, they are retained in longer, they stay on the stationary phase. Um, and those that uh, interact stronger with the mobile phase and will move through and move with the mobile phase then faster. So um, in this example here, this is paper chromatography. So if you had dots of ink across the bottom of the paper and then you drop the paper in a solvent like an alcohol or something like that, uh, then the solvent the alcohol will start creeping up the paper and move, it will start moving the dye okay, of, the, of the ink. The dye that's the most soluble with the solvent, with the alcohol, will move the fastest. It will move at the same speed as the uh, solvent is moving up the paper. And so this is what it put, this line here is saying is the solvent front. So the, the alcohol, if you will, has soaked all the way up here. And then you can see the, fir the one that's following the closest is going to be the red dot, uh, followed then by the green dot and then followed by the blue, and then the yellow obviously is interacting closer with the paper uh, because it's taking it a lot longer to just move up the paper so it's more attached to the paper. Um, and it has to do with simply the chemical composition of the dye and stuff like that. And so basically, if you have this in a column, uh, if, and if you're looking at what's coming out on the other side, uh, you would expect the red dye to come out first, and then the green, and then the blue, and then eventually the yellow. Uh, the retention time is related to the strength of the interaction with the stationary phase. So here in all of all dots, for example, the, the yellow would have the highest retention time. It would stay behind the longest and interact with the paper the, the most, whereas the red would have the least retention time. And the resolution is the ability to separate two or more analytes in a sample. It's the ability to tell the difference basically between the red and the green. And this is, um, obviously we know the color difference, but like if these were two things that you couldn't visi you know, uh, visually distinguish, like how do you tell the difference between the two? Uh, it has to do with the timing of them you know, leaving the, the, the stationary phase here. But... Um, the fact that they are separated enough by enough time, you can tell the difference between the two. Um, and if um, high, high resolution then allows you to really tell the difference between each compound, uh, if there's low resolution, then it's hard to distinguish between the compounds that are similar because they may, uh, they, they may come through at the same time. Okay, so um, for those of you guys who are on YouTube, I'm going to link this video simply uh, at the bottom instead of trying to play it. And I'll put it in the description, basically. Um, so which one would reach the end of the stationary phase first? Um, the compound with the short retention time or the compound with the long retention time? So again, application of retention time. All right, so um, there are different ways to separate um, products, things in a, a mixture, and we're going to look at all the different ways that you can separate. So these are all different types of chromatography. So the first one is ion exchange chromatography. It will use an ion exchange mechanism to separate analytes based on their charge. So ions have a charge, positive, negative, right? Uh, usually have a charged stationary phase, um, like an ion exchange re uh, resin. So for example, if, it, if the, that charged stationary phase was negatively charged, and they would be holding and attracting all the positive ions, right, and letting the negative ions flow through, and the negative ions would come out of that specific column first, so be separated out first. Uh, there's also partition chromatography. Uh, it relies on the differential distribution of solutes between two immiscible, cannot mix, right, uh, liquids. Uh, which represent a stationary phase in the mobile phase. Think water and oil. If you have um, a dye that's water soluble, it would be attracted, for example, to the water phase. And if you had a, a dye that was lipid soluble, like a Sudan dye, it would be attracted to the lipid, right? And so, and if you if you had the water and the lipid and the dye. Uh, or even both dyes, if you want, in, in uh, something, and it was all mixed together, 
uh, if you you know if they move through that, then what would happen is the lipid dye would go to the lipid, the water dye would go to the water. So this is just an il an illustration of the concept though of partition chromatography. Um, you also have adsorption chromatography. It separates um, stuff by adsorbing or desorption of the, the solutes in that solution to the surface of a solid particle that usually is in the column. So you have solid particle in the column and it is attracting something. And so that would be, uh, it would adsorb. So think, uh, think of it like a sticky note. So it, it would just kind of stick onto the bead in the column. Um, and as the other stuff washes through, and then you can desorb it, you can let it get it to let go, and then then it can flow out. Um, and this the, the sticking to the particle is called electrostatic hydrogen bonding. All right, so here it is, uh, a couple of these um, illustrates. So the ion exchange chromatography, where here the little beads have a positive charge. Therefore, they'll attract all the negative ions. And you see them illustrated there in green, and negative ions stick to the positive charge beads. But then all the positive ions are able to flow out, and you can separate all of them out from the sample. Uh, so that would be ion exchange chromatography. And then partition chromatography here, um, again, you you would uh, add the mix, and um, they the uh, you can see it's kind of hard to see, but like the smaller dots here representing one solute are attracted to the stationary phase, and so they are sticking to the beads, whereas the bigger uh, blue dots, which represents a different solute, are attracted to the mobile phase, and so they would flow out. Okay, so that would be, let's say, your water soluble stuff versus your lipid soluble stuff. Um, and so uh, the water soluble stuff as you wash through would come out first and you'd be able to separate it out and then all the lipid soluble stuff would be stuck on uh you know the other the bees or the other liquids or or whatever because it's um, it's two liquids on that one then you would add a different solvent or something like that to get it to wash out next Okay, there's also affinity chromatography. So if, uh, it's a liquid technique that will use biological interactions, such as the interactions between enzymes and substrates or antigens and antibodies to uh, separate different things. Um, and you could use it to uh, separate out certain antigens or separate out even certain antibodies or something like that. And then size exclusion chromatography um, is also known as gel permeation or gel filtration chromatography. Uh, the pores of the gels will sort molecules out by size. It does have low resolution, uh, but it is uh, possible. So affinity chromatography here, um, we have it illustrated with a mix coming in to the column. The column has uh, beads uh, that are coated with a ligand and the little red dot molecule uh, solute is represented here is attracted to the ligand that's coated on the beads and so as you're, you put your serum that has a little bit of everything in there comes through the little red dots in here that, that particular solute interacts and binds onto the ligand that's coated on the particles everything else is washed through and comes out so washed through, and then uh, you can actually wash it with a solution of the ligand by itself to get it to elute off of the particles. And uh, the, so the compound here, which are the little red, uh, represented by the red dots of that specific solute is what you're trying to separate out. And then it would come out all by itself uh, as you wash it with the ligand. Uh, and then this one is just showing the size exclusion chromatography. And this one, if you uh, pour a mix like a, a serum, whatever, and then you have these big beads there, um, actually, apparently, the, the smaller molecules will stop and interact with the beads more as the larger molecules flow through. Uh, and so to show here, first, larger molecules will come through, and then some of the smaller molecules, and then the tiniest molecules would come through. Uh, come out of the column, uh, so there's a difference in the time it takes for them to move through this column with, uh, depending on their size. So uh, there are different forms of chromatography. So there's planar column and gas. So um, 
basically it's pla planar and column are really the two big forms, but you know, planar chromatography, plain, uh, think flat surfaces, so two-dimensional, you know, kind of paper, right? So the stationary phase is on the plane. It could be either a paper, uh, so something small, thin, right? Or maybe uh, solid particles on the support medium. That's, you know, uh, something else, maybe a uh, gel or something like that. Uh, and it's the most common layer is thin layer chromatography. Um, but paper chromatography here uh, is illustrated where you have here, for example, a dot of black ink and the solvents or like water, whatever, in the paper. And you let the water creep up or the alcohol creep up the paper and it will separate this black dot into its component colors. Um, with the ones that have the highest affinity for water is going to move faster. Most affinity for the paper is going to stay behind most. But anyway, it's two it's two dimensional, so it's just on a plane. Column chron chromatography: um, the stationary phase is always coated onto support particles that are packed into a tube or a capillary tube, so uh, you know, 3D structure tube, right? And then uh, again. Uh, Gas chromatography, it uses a gas mobile phase, so that's the big difference with gas chromatography, but it also always uses a column uh, stationary phase. So a little bit more there on gas chromatography. Um, the solutes are going to be separated based on their vapor pressure differences, so how volatile they are, with the most volatile um, uh, solutes coming off of the sample first and entering the column first with the least uh, volatile going last. Um, and so a lot of times what you do is with gas, for gas chromatography is you use um, the gas chromatography to separate uh, you know, solutes that are flammable, that are all volatile like alcohols and stuff like that. Um, you to separate them and then they, they're leaving the column in, in order of volatility so they are separated as they leave the column and they can enter, for example, a detector like a mass spectrometer. And then a mass spectrometer can detect tell you what it is that's coming out of that column and then what's the next thing and then what's the next thing and then what's the next thing. Liquid chromatography, the mobile phase is liquid. Uh, it uses very small stationary phase particles, usually only 5 micrometers in pressure uh, to move stuff through the column. Um, high performance of chromatography or HPLC as an example of liquid chromatography. All right, so uh, your poll here, uh, in chromatography, which moves the fastest then? Uh, the molecule that is attracted to the stationary phase or the molecule that is attracted to the liquid phase? Um, and then let's talk a little bit about mass spectrometry. So again, um, mass spectrometry, as I just mentioned, is used to identify things like unknown compounds. Uh, it can also be used to determine the concentration of known substances and to study the molecular structure of organic and inorganic materials. The detector, it is the detector of choice for gas chromatography and liquid chromatography, meaning you would have uh, depending on what it is you're trying to detect, either a gas chromatograph or a liquid uh, chromatograph, where um, they would separate things out and then those things can enter, those solids can enter the mass spectrometer and be identified. Um, mass spectrometry is always coupled with an ionization source um, that will ionize the target molecule and then separate and uh, measures the mass of the molecule and its fragments. So um, we're going to talk about different ionization sources in just a minute. Again, this is another video. I'm not going to play it. I'm going to link it in the content, but it's a really good video explaining uh, mass chromatography. I'm sorry. I'm having afternoon brain. It explains mass spectrometry. <laughs> I have, I put gas chromatography and mass spec all together. Anyway, sorry about that. So it explains mass spectrometry. I'm going to um, and it is very well illustrated. So I'm going to attempt to explain some of this uh, with the pictures that I have. So the first um, thing that we need to talk, talk about is ionization. There are different ionization techniques in mass spectrometry. Um, the first one is electron impact ionization. Uh, and in this one, energ energetic electrons are emitted from a heated filament. So they're coming across here like they're, they're made from this, this heated filament and these electrons come across 
and they interact with the gas phase atoms or molecules um, of the sample. So the sample is going this way, and this all happens in a vacuum. So this is your, your sample is coming maybe from your gas chromatograph or uh, liquid chromatographer. So it's coming in here, and then uh, it's entering a vacuum, so it's, it's kind of spraying in, and then these electron, this electron beam is bombarding it at an angle, and um, what that does is it starts knocking pieces off of the molecules and stuff, and so it's uh, ionizing, creating ions um, there uh, from the... Uh, molecules that are coming into this that from the sample and flowing across okay the electron impact ionization is widely used in mass spectrometry the other there's another ionization technique is the MALDI um, ionization technique so MALDI stands for matrix assisted laser desorption ionization this is part the half of the MALDI TOF technology and MALDI-TOF in the lab is mainly used for bacterial identification. Um, MALDI-TOF is a soft ionization uh, and because it produces a mass spectra with little to no fragments uh, pieces at all. So um, it, uh, it is used to analyze like basically intact biomolecules like DNA and protein. There are two steps to this ionization technique. Um, first, um, after the sample has been obviously fixed on the, the plate right there, um, it's hit with a laser light, with UV laser light, and um, that causes it to desorb or to come off the plate, right, um, uh, along with uh, the matrix. So the sample and the matrix are mixed on the plate the laser hits the plate and both the matrix and the sample come off the plate, okay? And then uh, the ionization happens by gaining or losing protons to that UV absorbable matrix molecules that are in the gas phase. And so uh, the samples, uh, the sample um, molecule ions there are what's gonna enter the uh, detect well the, the time of flight uh, mass spectrometer that will detect what's there. So this is the first part of MOLITOF. And uh, so so a few more ionization techniques. There's ICP that stands for inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. So um, this ionization technique is used for metals at low concentration. Um, ICPMS is faster and more precise and more sensitive than uh, at atomic absorption spectrometry, which we looked at in part one. Uh, it can detect nanograms per liters to 100 milligrams per liter. It can detect multiple elements at one time and is often used in forensic and in toxicology, and it can do speciation of molecules, so it can tell the difference, for example, between chromium-3 and chromium-6, chromium-3 being good for your health, chromium-6 being really bad for your health, being toxic. Um, there's also chemical ionization, which is rarely used as it would use a reagent gas that collides with the analyzed create ions. And then there's also electrospray ionization. It's the ion source of choice for liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. The sample has to be purified first, um, but basically this allows the molecules to be transferred to a gas phase before they can enter the mass spectrometer. So after it is ionized, then what are the different uh, types of mass spectrometer designs that it can enter into? So uh, there's different beam type designs. Um, so we have the quadrupole mass spectrometer. So quadru, four poles, right? It has four poles uh, in this one. And um, the quadrupole will filter sample ions based on their mass to charge ratio uh, as they go through this quadrupole. And the detection of these ions is determined by the stability of their trajectory, of their path here through uh, an oscillating or changing back and forth changing electrical field. So it oscillates, the electrical field changes as these ions fly through this uh, quadrupole here. The time of flight one is slightly different. The mass to charge ratio is related to the velocity and it's determined by a time measurement in a set electrical field of known strength in a known 
length path to the detector. So it has two constants, and so basically how quickly it reaches the deter detector is going to uh, determine its master charge ratio. It can achieve very high resolution in the time of flight. Spectrometer is the other half of the Maldi TOF. TOF is time of flight. There are also trapping mass spectrometers. Um, they have a quadrupole ion trap that's used as part of, uh, of the mass spectrometer to help with uh, usually structural identification and sample identification. Uh, there's a linear ion trap. It can be a selective mass filter or an actual trap for the ions. Um, and then uh, this is also widely used. We have tandem mass spectrometers. So they're basically tandem, these two. There's two mass spectrometers uh, that are linked together. They are used in the clinical lab for the quantitative analysis of routine samples. The first mass, mass spectrometer will select the par parent ions by mass charge. Uh, and then it goes through a collision cell, which frag fragments and breaks up that parent ion. And then the second mass spectrometer acquires uh, the mass of the fragments. So first the intact molecule, then its components, its parts. So illustrated here, these, uh, okay, you have your electrospray ionization in this one, and then it enters the first quadrupole mass spectrometer where it detects the parent ions, and then it goes through a collision cell where uh, the, the ions are, or the, you know, the parent molecule is broken up into ions, ions are released, and then the ions are going through the next um, mass spectrometer here, the second one, um, quadrupole one again, and they are detected by the detector. The detectors are usually electron multipliers, and uh, you also, of course, have to have a computer and software attached to this. Um, the computer and software are going to control the instrument parameters um, and, of course, you know, run the detector and acquire and analyze the data that's collected. And so basically there's a database library of all the known mass to charge profiles uh, and that is used to identify your compounds. So if you're really good and you do these a lot, then you can get to where you can you know, recognize things and identify uh, the different profiles. So the printout and the profiles will kind of look, this is a, uh, a representation of what a mass to charge ratio uh, profile would look like with um, the higher peaks, meaning you have more of whatever each is, and then the location of each of these lines determines a different mass to charge ratio. Uh, so a lot of this one, a little bit of that one, but then where it's at on the line it, is determined by its mass to charge ratio. Okay, so the way I look at this is these look like maybe different skylines, CD skylines, right? And uh, this is the skyline of Chicago. And if, um, you know, if you really, if you knew Ch Chicago, then if you lived there or whatever, if you saw that, you're like, oh, I know what that is. But um, every city has its own specific skyline that you could recognize had you, you know, seen and visited a, a city. And um, the way the computer works is it basically compares this pattern with a database of patterns to tell you what it is that you have. Next, uh, there's electrophoresis. This is another separation technique. It separates, separates molecules using an electrical current. This is a typical electrophoresis chamber. Uh, it is commonly used to separate proteins. It can also be used to separate, separate DNA and RNA. Uh, the electrophoresis, again, is the separation of charged compounds in a liquid medium under the influence of an electrical field. So you have a current that's going to flow across this liquid, and usually you use um, some kind of auger media, support media. So the greater the charge, the faster it moves of the, the ion in the, the solution, uh, or the protein in the solution, sorry, the protein in the solution, the faster it will move towards the oppositely charged electrode. So all proteins have charges, but the charge of the protein is going to depend on the pH of the solution of that buffer that uh, the auger is sitting in and that that current is flowing through. Um, so you need the buffer solution, which will have ions and electrolytes and stuff that will carry that electricity across 
the solution and then you need a support me media like an agarose gel or polyacrylamide gel or something like that for the, the serum sample, the particles to move through. Uh, once these are separated into bands, then um, the support media are removed, the gels are removed and then stained so that you can visualize the different bands and how things separated according to, you know, with their charge and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can also use uh, densiometry uh, to measure the absorbance to find a concentration of each fraction. Um, and there are automated systems that can do this. And uh, it's a type of um, spectral photometry that's using that, um, where you have a light source, a monochromator, and it's sh shone through each, you know, uh, through each of the bands as it, as it moves the, the gel through. And um, the more concentrated it is, the harder it is for the light to go through. And then, of course, you have um, a photodiode, some, a detector on the other end, and then it would uh, translate into the readout. And so uh, if you look at it here, this is what uh, electrophoresis pattern would look like. And you can see bands are separated. And these are uh, stained with like, UV dyes things, but you can see how this is more concentrated. These are less. So there's more here, less there, and then um, there's usually a ladder or something that will interpret what each pattern means, uh, where which proteins separate out where. Um, so that's a really basic overview of electrophoresis. So a strongly positive molecule would migrate uh, to the positively charged end of the electrophoresis gel or to the negatively charged end of the electrophoresis gel. Uh, so there are different types of electrophoresis. There's zone electrophoresis, so it separates by charge and uses agarose gels. There's isoelectric focusing. It uses polyacrylamide gel with a pH gradient, and it, it immobilizes protein uh, on the gel at their neutral pH. And um, 2D electrophoresis uses um, isoelectrofocusing and then another technique called SES page. Uh, and it sorts by size, not by charge. Um, the blotting techniques, they separate DNA and DNA fragments in agarose gel electrophoresis, and then those fragments that have been separated out of the DNA are blotted. So literally, like uh, the, the nat natural cellulose paper is blotted onto the gel, uh, and then it picks it up, and then uh, that, that can be... Um, used to view the bands and stuff. Um, and so usually you use hybridized nucleic acid probes to, to view those. Uh, you can also do RNA and protein that way uh, via blotting techniques. So that would be um, northern blot, western blot, southern blot, all of those are different types of blotting techniques. There are uh, also capillary electrophoresis. Um, they use a narrow bore fused silica capillary to separate large and small molecules. Uh, it uses a high electric field strength. It separates on charge, size, and hydrophobicity. There is a wide range of application. It gets the highest resolution. It is more consistent and standardized, and it is easier to automate, so it's part of automated instrumentation. So, Capillary electrophoresis is uh, like kind of a newer thing, if you will. And then moving on, we're going to talk about collaborative uh, properties. So um, these are the properties of solution that are dependent upon the number of solute particles to the number of sol solvent particles. So basically, depending uh, on how concentrated your solution is, these guys will change. And your osmolality uh, is what we measure the um, osm is related to the osmotic pressure, and the osmotic pressure will govern movement across membranes. So for us, so we mean movement into or out of cells or across capillary the capillary wall, etc. Um, freezing point depression is the way that we measure osmolality. We're going to talk about that. So first, a little bit more on your colligative pro properties. So your osmolality will go up. You will have a higher osmolality. Um, if um, and when the os sorry, when the osmolality goes up, these elevate. So um, the more concentrated the solution is, the higher the osmolality of a concentration of a solution is, 
the higher its boiling point. Um, so boiling point elevation is not really favored for biological samples because boiling the proteins degrades their structure, etc. And so we just don't do that. We don't use that pro colligative property to calculate osmolality. Osmotic pressure. Uh, so it will increase. The osmotic pressure increases the more concentrated a solution is. Um, osmotic pressure is slow to equilibrate. You need a large volume to measure it, and the me membrane behavior is not always reproducible, so we don't use that uh, to measure osmolality. Vapor pressure depression is the most accurate, but it's slow and requires very precise temperature control. Vapor pressure drops as osmolality increases. And then freezing point depression, freezing point drops as osmolality increases. So it's harder to freeze something that is more concentrated. Um, and so this is uh, the method of choice used in the lab. Um, it's the cryoscopic method. It is convenient, rapid, only requires small volumes. And so that is what we use. We're going to look at freezing point depression. So osmometry is a measure of the osmolality of an aqueous solution, such as serum, plasma, or urine. Uh, we can measure any of them. We usually do serum and urine, though. Um, your osmo osmotically active particles, so the things that will change your osmolality, will have an impact on your osmolality reading, are things such as glucose, urea, sodium, but then also things that are there that might not normally be there, like alcohol or antifreeze or something like that. So um, anything that's been ingested and has made it into the blood could affect the osmolality. And the more of these particles are present in the sample, the higher the osmolality is. It does affect all the other four polygative properties of the solution, but we only use freezing point depression in the lab. Uh, so it is basically osmolality measurement is highly effective means of determining simply the no total number of particles that are present in blood, urine, or the fluids. But it does not tell you what those are. It just says this blood is really concentrated or this blood is really dilute or this urine is really concentrated or this urine is really dilute. That's pretty much all it's going to tell you. But uh, it, is, it is good information to have. So which sample would you expect to have the highest osmolality? A sample with a glucose of 85 and a sample with a glucose of 400. That would be all other things being equal. So let's talk a little bit about how the freezing point osmometer works. Um, the sample is super cool, so it's cool below freezing. And then freezing is initiated. And it's initiated with a probe that uh, will, will move and start the crystallization process. Um, and as the, the, the liquid then is crystallized, because it's below freezing, so it's going to become a solid, uh, the temperature actually will rise back up to its freezing point, releasing the heat of fusion and creating the ice crystals. Um, the parts of an osmometer are the sample chamber, the stirrer, the thermistor for assessing the temperature, and the refrigerator chamber that usually has ethylene glycol to refrigerate, you know, to cool the sample below uh, freezing. The unit of reading is in milliosmoles per kilogram of water. Um, and um, I'm going to link this video also. So this, like, really illustrates this call. Um, water bending or uh, so if you ever seen um, a take a water bottle and you lay it in a freezer and you basically cool it below freezing but before it freezes so the water's still liquid then if you actually tap the bottle then it freezes the whole bottle instantaneously it's really cool to watch so anyway I'm gonna link this below also in my content for you guys uh, so this is what a typical freezing point osmometer it looks like. It's a pretty simple machine. Uh, and so basically you have the sample, you have a fast cool below its freezing point, uh, and then you, you have this activation of, uh, the, of the crystallization process where uh, the heat of fusion is rapidly released and it, it rises to its freezing point. And its freezing point is going to be determined by how much stuff is uh, in there. 
and then you get that stabilizer and you get the read out because it, it freezes there, it solidifies there. Um, one of the practical applications of this is simply salting your sidewalk in the winter so that the sidewalk doesn't freeze in ice. So you put salt, which are, are solutes, particles, that are mixed with the water if it's icy or rainy or something like that, and it's going to drop below freezing. Um, and uh, that prevents, it, it drops the freezing point, hopefully, um, where it's not, you know, um, your, your outside temperature doesn't go below that freezing point and stuff like that, and so that your sidewalk doesn't freeze. So you turn water into salt water so that it freezes at a lower temperature than what it normally would, than, you know, than freezing in 32 Fahrenheit and zero Celsius. And then a couple of other things to talk about is point of care testing. Um, point of care testing is always performed at or near the patient. So you usually have a handheld device of some sort that you can carry to the patient and you can test at bedside. Um, the um, advantage will include a faster turnaround times because you have the result right there you can sit by the patient or you could go back to the nurse's station, but you have the result right there. It usually takes uh, you know, between a few seconds to a few minutes to read. And it's easy to use. It's usually very, you know, it's portable. Um, it's very, it's usually a cartridge or a strip or something like that, a drop of blood. There's just, uh, it's not complex at all. Um, the disadvantages of point of care testing is, of course, there's a limited menu. Uh, and then the cost per test is always higher than the cost on uh, the large analyzers that can do higher volume. Um, an example would be simply uh, a glucose, you know, like a, your Accucheck glucose strips, for example. Why you need is a strip and a drop of blood in the little reader device and uh, very portable and all of that. And uh, these are actually quite affordable. Others in the lab is there are some devices like that where you can measure electrolytes. You can do some coagulation studies and uh, you can do some uh, ABG testing at bedside. But again, all of these usually they cost more than running it on the big analyzers. The other issue that you have to consider is you want that point of care device to be able to connect to your um, charts, to your electronic medical record or electronic health record system so that when you do, for example, a point of care glucose on a patient, that result actually uh, automatically populates into the chart without you having to manually enter it, and then you can also automatically bill for it. So uh, it does need to have a good connectivity into the established system that you have. And it should also connect to the lab information system so the lab has record uh, of all of this. But either way, it should be able to populate to the patient chart uh, relatively easily. Uh, sometimes what it happens is the device itself needs to dock onto a station that then communicates with the uh, electronic health record system. And then flow cytometry is used to diagnose and stage leukemias, lymphomas, and other cancers. Um, the fluidics allow for the analysis of one cell at a time, so one cell passing through at a time. It uh, often uses a couple of lasers, um, and the electronics will convert the electrical signals into then a digital format, and then you can do data analysis with computers and stuff like that. So that's a really quick run through your flow cytometry. Um, there, uh, you can find out more about it um, by just reading up and watching other videos. I'm not going to go into detail here. So anyway, if you're on Nearpod, this is a little um, activity for you, and uh, other than that, if you have any questions, if you're on your pod, you feel free to uh, drop that. And if not, you can always drop one below in the comments. And if I know, I might answer the question. So thank you so much.